Good morning. If you watched last week's sermon, you may have noticed I'm wearing the same shirt. It's because I recorded these the same day. And, you know, I wasn't smart enough to change shirts so that you would know, so that you wouldn't know that. But I'm, I'm going to be out of pocket for a period of time. And so I needed to get these lined up and ready to go so that they would be in place. And, and so I recorded them both the same day, obviously different locations. I've always wanted to do one here. I've always wanted to come to this place and and sit and record the sermon um, because it's a, it's a it's a place that has great meaning for me. This is uh, Boulder Springs at Falls Creek. If you're not familiar with it, and some of you will say that's not Boulder Springs. That's the Devil's Bathtub. Well, it was the Devil's Bathtub for a long time, and they renamed it. Okay, so just get over it. It's Boulder Springs. Uh, there are two springs here. There's one behind me. There's one across from me, and. And I suspect that the noise is a little bit loud, and so I've, I've kind of avoided coming here because I, I thought maybe the water would distract, but, but I, have a, I have a message for us today that I, want us, I wanted to do from here because it, uh, it's about worship. We're going to be in Isaiah, uh, specifically chapter 6. I've preached this passage on, a numer on numerous occasions as, as, as uh, recent as 2018 at the church, and... Um, the, the passage we're going to read is, is, the, is the passage that outlines for us Isaiah's call as a prophet. And uh, I, I mentioned last week that the book of Isaiah is one of my favorite in the Old Testament. I love reading it. I love the stories. I love the, I love the way that it, it, it helps us to understand who God is and what his plan for us is, even, even to the point of of, of telling us about the, the Savior that was going to come in Jesus Christ later, 700 years later. And, and so it, it is a powerful passage of Scripture, um, a powerful book in Scripture. And when we, when we talk about this place where God called Isaiah to ministry as a prophet, there are some things that I want us to examine. Now, in my mind, when I read the passage, and it's going to be verses 1 through 8 of chapter 6 in Isaiah, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn that way. I've always understood this passage to talk about worship, and that's what it's always talked about to me. And I know that we've changed that word uh, in culturally in churches and stuff today that, that you say, well, well, we worship, we all stand and sing and raise our hands and, and, and do whatever it is that, that you you kind of have pictured in your mind about worship, but, but worship is so much more than just music. Now, don't get me, don't get me wrong. I, I love great worship music. I love standing in a room with people and, and worshiping. I, I love old hymns. I love the hymns that we sing at our church there at Darty and, 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 and the using of our voices and singing hymns and praises to God is absolutely uh, one of the greatest forms of worship that exists, but it's not the only form. And I'm afraid that we've taken that word worship and we've said, you know what, worship is, is singing and praising and going on. And, and that, that is a component. The thing that we need to understand about worship is, is that it, it, it has more to it than that. And so let's read together in this passage and let's see if we can't, <coughs> excuse me, see if we can't um, see what, see what I'm seeing and, uh, and hopefully walk away with a, a renewed or a refreshed idea about what it is to worship God. Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And when he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? 
and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for our time together this morning. And I know that as I read this passage, every time I read this passage, I, I think about the day that you called me into ministry. I think about the days that you've called so many people into the ministries that they serve in. And, and God, the, the, the uniqueness of that experience. But I also think about the day that you called me to salvation that you provided for me a way to have my sins atoned for in the person of Jesus Christ. And so God, today, as we read these verses, as we, uh, as we begin to understand who we are in relation to you and who you are in relation to us and, and what it is to truly worship, God, I, I pray that you would fill our hearts with worship for you and your son Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Real worship requires God's presence. Do you notice when, when Isaiah walked into the temple, and by the way, Isaiah was, was no stranger to the temple, I am sure. I'm sure that it is a place that he went on regular, regular occasion, regular basis. I suspect there were times that Isaiah walked into the temple and it was just like every other day when he walked into the temple, but this day was different. This day when he walked into the temple, he had for the very, maybe not the first time, but for a, a very real realization of the presence of God in the temple. It, 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 was, it was clearly uh, an experience for him where he knew he stepped out of his normal routine, his daily life, and he stepped into the very presence of a living God. And so if we're going to have real worship, the first step in all of this is, is getting into God's presence. And I will tell you, there's, there's many ways that you can do that. I, I'm going to be really honest with you. I can sit here in this place and know that I'm in God's presence. Theologically speaking, because I have accepted Christ as my Savior and Lord, because I have asked Him to forgive me of my sins and to save me, I know that I live constantly in God's presence because the Scripture says, that the Holy Spirit of God indwells the believer, the person who gives their life to Christ. So the Spirit of God goes with us everywhere we go. And so I, I, I get theologically that there is nowhere that we can go that we're not in God's presence. But the, the, the reality is that when Isaiah walked into this temple, this place that he's gone so many times before, he walks in this day and knows he is in God's presence. You know, sometimes we go to a place so that we can do that. I, I've, I've come to Boulder Springs and I hear the water and I see God's nature and, and, and the, you know, the holy ground of Falls Creek, so to speak. And, and, and I know that I'm in God's presence. But the truth is when I'm driving down the interstate in my pickup by myself, I am in God's presence. And so in order for us to worship, we need to realize that we're in God's presence. But the next thing we see in the passage is that, that real worship illustrates who God is. And so let's, let's read again uh, some of those verses I already read. When I, Isaiah walked into the temple, he said, he said this about the experience. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. Two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. I could spend all day talking about the imagery that Isaiah painted for us in those words. I'll keep it simple. The imagery that, that Isaiah painted for us was the realization of who he was, where he was in the presence of God. He realized that God was high and exalted, that he was, he was above us, that he was beyond us, that he was greater than us. The, the relationship between man and his creator was, was made greatly evident to him. And then these seraphs that were in the room, they had they had two, uh, they had six wings and with two they covered their faces and with two they covered their feet and with two they were flying. And, and the imagery and, and the, of the words is just fantastic. It's it, the modesty that they showed in the presence of God, the, the service that they showed in the presence of God by, 
by with their flying of their wings. Just the they knew who they were in relation to God, and and seeing that helped Isaiah know who he was as well. And then the smoke filled the room, and I. You know, there's, there's, the Catholic Church uses smoke in their services a lot. They have a little thing. I don't know what it's called. I, I'm sure there's a, a proper name for it. I call it the Holy Smoke. And uh, I, you know, I'm sure that's completely incorrect. And you're welcome to send me a message and tell me the real name if you want to. But they use that as imagery to, to, to represent the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, God is invisible to us. In, in terms of being able to see. I don't see a person dressed in here. I don't see those things with my eyes. And, and so to, to illustrate the, the way that God permeates a place or, or permeates some places, they, they, Isaiah described this smoke and it filled the room. And so what he was understanding was that there was no place in this room that God wasn't, that, that it, just, it just goes. You know, it, it, it's very difficult for me to describe exactly what <laughs> what I want to say, but oh my goodness. High and exalted describes his holiness and, and the seraphs around him show the service of those that, that live for him, that serve him, and, and the smoke shows his presence in the room and, and we know who we are in relation to God by that experience. Do you remember how Moses had to hide his face from God as he passed? In the cleft of the rock, God passed by, and and um, and He was not allowed to look at Him. And so, in order to have real worship with God, we have to have an experience with God in worship that illustrates the magnitude of His holiness. Even the seraphs had to hide their face from God. And so, we need to understand who God is. We need to understand his complete holiness, his complete um, royalty and majesty. But then we also need to know that we're in his presence. And so real worship, we've, we have to get into God's presence. Real worship, we have to understand who we are in relationship to God. And then real worship actually reveals more to us about who we are. In verse 5, uh, Isaiah said, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You know, it really, it doesn't take a whole lot of holiness for me to realize who I am. I mean, I can see people that are so much better than me at being a Christian, and so much more holy than I am, and and I can look at people and say, gosh, why can't I live a life like that? Why can't I, I exhibit the same level of holiness that they have? And so if I can see people and realize my lack of holiness, what if I could understand God's holiness and my holiness in compared to His? Lost a friend this week. He uh, was actually run over by a car in the church parking lot. He had, he had been, he was... His name was Clyde Kane, and some of you may know him, some of you may not. Clyde was uh, was an amazing individual. He was instrumental, by the way, in, in me becoming the, the IT director for the BGCO years ago. He worked there when I first started, and and I took classes, uh, seminary classes, where he was the professor, and and I I got to know Clyde really well. Clyde helped. He had a he had a little tape series that he made about um, seeking a pastor, and and talked about how to use how to use a search committee well to find a pastor for your church. Probably one of the most useful resources I ever used when I served on a pulpit, pulpit committee. Clyde was one of those guys that when you talked to him, you knew that he, he lived what he believed and his holiness showed. And I, I would get around him and I'd say, man, why can't I be a man of God like that? You know, I want to be a man of God like that. And so it, it, was, it was clear to me this, this vast difference between he and I. I got to tell you something, when I, when I get into real worship and I'm in the presence of God and, and I realize His majesty and His holiness and, and I step before Him, I, I feel way more like Isaiah than I want to say. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips and I may live among a people of unclean lips and, 
and mine eyes have seen the living Lord. I have, I have become intimately aware of who God is in relationship to where I am. Isaiah was, was living in Israel, a, a nation that was just filled with sin. And so he described not only his own sin, but the, the sin of those around him. And, and so it wasn't just that he saw his own, he saw everyone's, and he, and he just was ruined by it. And so real worship will reveal things in our hearts that we need to know. You know, we call it, we have a church word for it today. We call it conviction. We, we get into a worship experience where we encounter that living God. We recognize who he is. We see who he is. We see who we are. And all of a sudden our heart starts hurting and we start feeling guilty and, and all of those things. And we say we're being convicted of our sin. And, and, it, and it's, a, it's kind of a churchy word. But, but the reality is that it, our sin just shows. It becomes so illuminated that, that we understand how sinful we really are. And all of a sudden, we, we feel the weight of our failures. That realization will not be comfortable. The most uncomfortable place for a sinner is worship. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? You know, in, our, in the vernacular of the word today, we say, you know, worship is standing up and feeling good and raising our hands, and it's all about warm fuzzies and and the reality is there is some of that there is absolutely some of that but on the heels of those warm fuzzies comes the realization of how short we fall and and so it becomes very uncomfortable and it may hurt it may discourage us it may likely cause us even to cry the truth is that there's no one righteous not one paul told us that and so when we come into the place where we have a worship, a real worship experience with a living God, we're going to see things in ourselves that we're not going to like. Because we realize we want to be like Him. We want to be holy. And so we worship. Either way, when we, we stand in God's presence, worship will help us see who we really are. But then real worship deserves a response. In verse 5, Isaiah said, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then a seraph enters the picture. And with tongs from the altar, he takes a live coal, and he flies to Isaiah, and he touches his lips, and he says this, See, this has touched your lips, your sin, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the Lord say, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. You know, it's really hard to break this passage up into pieces that you can preach it expositionally where you, you take and you find... You find um, uh, points and illustrations in each one because I'm going to be real honest with you this entire passage has one point and that one point is worship changes us the second thing I want to be really honest about is, is for years decades even I've read this passage and I've left myself laying on the floor saying I am ruined maybe maybe I realize that like, like Isaiah did when the seraph flew and touched his mouth with the live coal maybe I realized that that, that my sins were forgiven, but I still laid there on the floor in ruins. I mean, I grasp the idea that when I confess my sin to Christ and He forgives me of my sin, that sin is forgiven. It's atoned for. He paid the price for it on a cross. I don't have to die because of my sin because Jesus died for me. I get that. And yet I still left myself laying on the floor ruined you know that's kind of the picture I had of this of Isaiah when he realized how sinful he was and how sinful the people around him were he laid prostrate on the floor and just crying that he was ruined but there's another response in this and I, and I think it's incredibly important the response where God says whom shall I send and who will go for us and Isaiah stands up and he raises his hands and he says to God, Here am I. 
Send me. From the man that was ruined lying on the floor to the person whose sin was forgiven, his guilt was taken away, his sin atoned for, he rises to his feet and realizes that he is the person that God wants for this task. And he says, oh God, please send me. Isaiah's response was was perfect. He confessed his sin before God and he realized that he needed forgiveness and he received that forgiveness from God. And then he took up his cross, so to speak, and followed him. The rest of Isaiah's call, if you continue to read down in that passage, you find out very quickly that what God was calling Isaiah to was not huge success. In fact, he was calling him to utter failure. He said, you're going to be among people who will not listen. They will not respond. They will not do what you ask them to do. They will not hear what you have to say. They will not return from their wicked ways. But I'm still calling you. And Isaiah said, hear my Lord. Send me. For us, salvation doesn't come from a live coal, thankfully. Um, If I were to walk down the aisle of a church convicted of sin, feeling ruined the way Isaiah did, and and talk to a pastor during an invitation and say, I need to be saved. If he pulled a live coal off an altar with a set of tongs and went to touch my face with it, I probably would have a problem. Thankfully, my sin is forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. He hung on that cross and died so that I could be saved. He atoned for my sin. He paved the way for my salvation. And so all I have to do is confess my sin, believe that Jesus is who He says He is, receive the salvation. And then the responses, that is one of the responses, the second response is, here am I, send me. That's worship. That's worship that really changes us. When we have a service, we do lots of things in a service. We we sing songs, and that's worship. We pray, and that's worship. We read scripture, and that's worship. We proclaim the word of God. That's what preachers do from pulpits. Hopefully, that's what preachers do from pulpits. And, and through that proclamation, we worship. We even, as we pass an offering plate, and you give money in an offering plate, that is an act of worship. If we're doing any of those things just because they're things, worship won't change us. Oh, but if we do, if we enter into the presence of God, we recognize His majesty and His holiness. We see ourselves for who we really are and, and, and confess that sin and ask for it to be forgiven and, and then exclaim in great gratitude, Lord, you have everything I am. I will go wherever you send. I will do whatever you do. I'll do whatever you say. God, I just want to be yours. Then we'll know we've worshiped. Father, I I know that there have been so many times where I've walked into a church and walked out the same person I was when I walked in. I know that there are many times that I have not realized that I'm in your presence and I've acted in ways that I should not have acted, said things I should not have said. God, today I want you to know, I know I'm in your presence. I think the people listening and watching to this are, are saying to you today, I pray that they're saying to you today, we know that we're in your presence and because we're in your presence, we want to be different. We want to change from who we were to who you want us to be. And God, we all have sin in our life and we confess it to you today. We ask you to forgive it through the power of your son Jesus and his blood on that cross. Let our sin be atoned for so that we might serve you with gladness. And God, the last thing we say to you today is here we are. Send us, because we are yours. Father, I pray that we leave 
this place wherever we are today, right now, knowing that we've worshipped a holy God. Thank you for your son Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. I hope that you received something from that. I, maybe that passage is just for me. Maybe I'm the only one that needs to know what it is to worship and to practice it. But listen, you find these things, the presence of God, the understanding of his majesty and holiness and the understanding of who you are, and then the response that you have because of that, you will find worship. And I pray you do. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that you, you have a great week and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.